Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our last Engaging Arts and Humanities Faculty of Creative Arts uh, under the Visual Arts Studies program. Today we have um, Anida Yuali, uh, who will be presenting uh, a talk on the diasporic dilemma performing from the in between. Uh, this is a really interesting talk for us here at the university, only because I think a lot of our students, not just in the visual arts, are dealing with some of these issues, very pressing issues that you will be highlighting today. And joining in, after, uh, in joining our discussion today after your presentation will be our newly appointed um, research fellow, Mr. Khaled Ramadan, who will be uh, discussing for your presentation today. So a bit of introduction, uh, Anida Yuali is an artist, educator and global agitator. Raised in Chicago and born in Cambodia, she's a woman of mixed heritage, always Malay, Cham, Khmer and Thai ancestry. So I'd really like you to unpack that for us later because this is a, a lot of very interesting uh, backgrounds and influences that's causing through your practice. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, perhaps also to help us to understand how you're framing this in relation to being a global agitator. That mm -hmm. would be something that uh, would be of interest to me, for me to sort of find out today. Uh, I think your performance, your interdisciplinary practice spans performance, installation, videos, images, public encounters, and many different types of agitation, so to speak, right? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, you're very well known already by um, the arts community and also to a lot of our colleagues here. Um, your works have been shown in many museum exhibitions and you're currently serving as a senior artist in residence at the University of Washington Bothell mm -hmm. and travels between the Asia Pacific region and the US. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to cede the floor to Anida. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, thank you uh, to the university here for welcoming me and uh, booking the space and doing all the promotion and invitations. Um, I understand it is the end of your semester. So I feel you because of course my quarter also ended and um, it couldn't come sooner since uh, one of the reasons why I'm touring the region is I'm actually on sabbatical leave uh, this upcoming year. Um, and if you know if you're in academia, you know the value of that sabbatical year to rest and research and kind of you know think through, um, have the time. To, to kind of think through um, certain ideas and creative practice um, so that uh, you can step away from teaching and then come back to it with uh, freshness. Um, it's a real honor to come back to Malaysia, to Kuala Lumpur. I think the last time I was here was in 2019 uh, at Weiling Gallery, um, who hosted the solo exhibition of um, the Buddhist Bug uh, series, and that was actually the biggest um, show to date that really comprehensively showed that work, uh, which spanned 10 years worth um, of that performance, interdisciplinary performance work, and I'll touch a little bit about it. But I want to bring your attention to this quotation that I've put up here um, in this, this uh, visual image. It is a neon sign um, that borrows from uh, an actual quote from Sherry uh, Rabinowitz in 1984, but was done by an LA based artist. Her name is Lauren Bond. And the quotation here is artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. If we just sit a little bit with thinking about that idea, I think it will put into frame what my work and how I move through my life um, is about. I ultimately believe that to counter destruction, you must create and that art 
in its essence is about creation is the counter i would argue it is the counter to war to destruction to colonial settler ideology to fascism to things that are set up to destroy humanity or pieces of our humanity so this reminds me that i do think about my work not on a small scale but about larger impact um the other thing for me that's important is the year 1975 so in 1975 uh I actually see people that I think might be my generation. Um and if not, I'll I'll put it into a little more context to give you the idea of why 1975 is an important year for me and and I would I would say for the world in my generation. So in 1975 you have the film Jaws was released, was a big hit for those of you in cinema and film studies. Uh in 1975 you have the Japanese electronics manufacturing uh company Sony releases a Betamax video cassette recording system. Some of you might think that's very um archaic but that was really the predecessor to so much of digital recording. In 1975 the UK actually voted to enter the EU. a little bit ironic if you understand Brexit 1975 the boxer Muhammad Ali beats Joe Frazier in the famous match Thriller in Manila in the Philippines in 1975 the 15 year civil war in Lebanon begins between the Christians and the Muslims and in 1975 here in Kuala Lumpur you had a major hostage crisis in the AIA building in which the Japanese Red Army an organization called the Japanese Red Army took 50 hostages inside the AIA uh building which housed several embassies and the gunmen the terrorists were able to release five imprisoned terrorists so uh there was some negotiation that allowed for that and they then flew those those uh prisoners to Libya here in Kuala Lumpur and then in 1975 for me the Khmer Rouge a Cambodian communist regime takes control of Cambodia and marches into the capital city of Phnom Penh which causes the fall of Phnom Penh um and it was the year that everything changed for my family and for the trajectory of my life and i was born in 1973-74 december 73 if you follow the um the lunar calendar january 74 for um the birthday that my father had to make up because we didn't have records uh, when they were processing me in the refugee camps so if you do see a lot of my biography you'll see there is sometimes it'll be listed as 73 and sometimes 74 so i have a legal birthday and then i have the actual birthday of 1973 that i um that i embrace um and so with the fall of phnom penh and the khmer rouge entering cambodia now you have a uh, intense warfare um a, a civil warfare um and you have um a situation in which um for the first time in the world 1 million refugees are created in a crisis at the border you also have the muslim population in cambodia which was 5% before the khmer rouge period then dropped to 2.5% um in those uh 3 years of the khmer rouge domination they targeted muslims my family Khmer Muslims and Cham Muslims those two distinct Muslim groups so again trying to set the stage here for the trajectory of my work and why I take an anti-war stance but why war and trauma and crisis continue to inform my work and why I also seek 
for beauty and for joy as a way to counter those ideologies. So in 1975, I was about one year year old, uh, one years old, and I was really too young to remember the atrocities that happened uh, and the famine that my family endured in that period. Um, this was a time of, uh, you know, where one fifth of the population um, was was killed. And also um, another interesting thing is that 90% of artists were killed under the Khmer Rouge. So you're seeing again this theme of if you if uh, you see my my the varying identities that I hold from artist to Muslim to um, mixed ethnically. Um, and as I said, the um, Muslims were targeted for extermination. Um, and then I also like to acknowledge that I was in the refugee camps. And then here, I often begin my talks with the earliest photo of myself um, in the refugee camp. And I'm not sure if you can guess which child in this photo is me. Uh, people often have a hard time. Um, but why don't I ask the audience, which of these children do you think is me? The toddler where? The, the girl with the white shirt? Oh, the toddler behind the girl with the white shirt. Good guess. Anybody else? The one in the green. Okay, that's a little off. Yeah, can you guess, little girl, little daughter of mine? <laughs> the late right there by your grandma, the one, that child. Okay, very good guess. And that is your grandmother there in the pink shirt, a very young version of your grandmother. Um, she is actually behind the barbed wires carrying my brother, your uncle Mustafa. Um, and I am, that is correct, Simon. <laughs> I am the little redhead by the care package, the box. And so this is the equivalent to what people would have as baby photos, right? Except that I don't have any of those baby photos and this is the closest to me. I am the child with these sort of sunburned uh, red hair holding on to that care package. You're looking at photos, archival photos from my family that was taken by my Thai family who got word from my grandfather who was already flown out to the US because he was a soldier in the Lan Nol government, which was the opposing force to the Khmer Rouge and backed by the US. And because my grandfather was locked outside of the country during the fall of Phnom Penh, he was able to be airlifted by the Americans outside. So in 1975, my grandfather, along with one of his children, my aunt, who was uh, fought, was in foster care in Thailand because my grandmother had 10 children. My grandmother is Thai. She could not feed everyone. And she left one of her child with her Thai family. And luckily that child then met with her father, my grandfather, and the two of them were flown out while the rest of us endured the Khmer Rouge atrocities. So that is to bring it back to what uh, Simon described as part of my ancestry with the Thai heritage. So you're looking at a moment when my family was, um, uh, my grandfather was told the borders have reopened and, and and I need you guys to go to the Thai refugee camp because they said Cambodians are arriving there and I want to know if my family survived. And so my Thai family came to the camps, found us, gave us clothes and gave us this care package. Um, I, I, I actually don't know what's in it, but I think another shocking part of the image is the barbed wires, right? Why do we need to have the barbed wires there? Is it to keep the refugees in and safe or to keep people out? It's very unclear. And this is an imagery uh, that I do work with and have tried to work with um, in 
kind of stitching and restitching these photos into um, a small mixed media piece. But to me, um, this kind of visual art doesn't quite work for me. I think it's missing the activation of the body. Um, and all of this is also to say that my journey as a performance artist has come, come through by way of, of America and by being raised as an Asian person in America and kind of coming into my anger. And so some of these images you're seeing are just uh, myself performing as my alter ego, Atomic Shogun, uh, and in a poetry group called I Was Born With Two Tongues. In the late 90s and early zeros, we created um, kind of a critical mass for Asian Americans who created poetry and who were unapologetic with who they are and with a politicization that people in the performance poetry scene had not experienced before. I was also part of a spoken word and multimedia all women's uh, performance group called Mango Tribe. Um, and then I also created my own one woman show. And I would say that the one woman show called Living Memory, Living Absence was my final attempt to put to rest um, the story, the very literal story of my family's journey and the trauma um, and the sort of the diasporic body in America and what happens in America when you try to tap into those lost memories and those lost moments. Um, this is so that you kind of get an idea that for me, it's performance. For me, my work um, really comes alive with performance and through performance. And it's because of all these reasons that I've put up here, because it activates, it heals, it provokes, even triggers. It's also immediate as well as it takes time. And it is a, a, a discipline that can happen anywhere, anytime, by anyone. You actually don't need a lot of things, experience. You need to have the courage, I would say, would be the biggest um, tool the, that uh, to, to create performances. My work has um, taken a lot of different uh, paths with performance, even to um, creating text, large signage text where the text performs in public spaces, or um, in this case, in front of my house, um, which is in Tacoma, um, just south of Seattle in Washington State. Um, this is a project I created with my husband and collaborator, Masahiro Sugano, and it was an introduction to the neighborhood to sort of um, invite people to take down fences and to talk to one another. Um, and this is with the big question, uh, the big statement, hello, how are you? Um, and so here you see text, uh, which is a big thread in my work in terms of the narrative quality, but here the text performs and the performance is the neighborhood and the people who experience this. Um, part of my process involves a lot of research um, ideas and resources, the creation, and then ultimately the audience. The audience is very important as witnesses, as active participants and viewers um, who are experiencing the work. Um, other themes that I'm just going to run through so that I can get to some of the work, um, loss and absence, the body as sight, activation through presence, um, and then the public sphere, really the public and the activation of public spaces um, through performance and acknowledging that the body um, with all of our history and genetic codings and everything we bring, that the body um, has content. And that is the materiality of performance, that it relies on the body, not just as a canvas, but as content itself, that you cannot have a read without acknowledging who that body belongs to. 
Um, I create a lot of mythical heroines and and that's my attempt in finding beauty in displacement. Um, and so one of the pieces um, I want to talk about are some of the works that I've created in Cambodia. So you'll see me um, creating works that are just kind of testing out the public space um, and putting my body, whether it's um, a form of labor, like this act of trying to sew the wall um, in a cafe space, to trying to um, push the public square here. Uh, this is a bigger body of work into the middle of traffic to see if in the hustle and bustle of Cambodia, can we have a moment of intimate conversations? Where is that space to do that? And ultimately, the resolve for me is creating this 24-hour piece called The Public Square, uh, which is inspired by Marina Abramovich, is, um, the, the artist is present. Uh, and here you see me working with um, other local artists in Cambodia that are dressed in white, and each artist it was my attempt to take them out of their studio and into the public space. There was this very Western idea that was um, permeating the contemporary performance art scene in Cambodia and the contemporary art scene in general, which is that artists were following a model where you kind of quietly work in a studio and you kind of hide and you secretly work on things and then you have a show and you show it in a sort of white cube space, a pretty gallery with white walls. Um, and I was actually really moved by Cambodia itself and um, how beautiful and exciting and interesting the layers of, of all the places were. And I was trying to ask the question of why can't we work in this environment and in this habitat? And so this is a performance that was 24 hours long where I made a, a square, pushed it into the middle of a park space and asked each artist to sit for an hour where the other seat would uh, would be occupied by whoever was, was present, whoever was coming by, and anybody could sit there and have um, a private conversation with an artist. Um, there are many, many pictures from this. Um, other performances, the White Mother series is in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, um, and this was in response to um, talking and researching with working um, mothers, working mothers who were trying to raise their kids, and most of them had to give up their jobs to be the primary caretakers in their household. And, um, through my research, I found out that many of them felt that they were being viewed as a nuisance to society because if any of you have children, you know that especially when you have young children, it's difficult to move around quickly and you always have to lug a lot of things with you, the bag, the stroller, the different items, the clothing change, the snacks, the uh, diapers. Um, and so Japanese women were feeling looked at as if they were taking up too much space or weren't allowed in certain places because they were occupying so much space in their ability to move around with their kids. And so this was um, a heroine figure that I created uh, uh, in collaboration with my partner, Masahiro Sugano, where she's wearing um, a traditional bridal hat, and then she's wearing loose clothing. She's painted completely white, and she's basically pushing a live baby, um, and that baby is that child right there, Hada Sugano, when she was only three months old. And that was a result of um, having to negotiate for a residency in which the original proposal was uh, was about feminism and was about comparing contemporary feminism. But I proposed it before I gave birth. And then by the time I got the residency, I had already given birth. But at that point, um, 
they didn't want me to come with my family. So this produced a different kind of dilemma, but um, over several hundred emails to negotiate, I finally uh, really pushed that in order for this to make sense for me, I'm not going to stop breastfeeding my baby. I need to come with my baby. If I come with my baby, I would like my partner and the rest of my children to come because that will help the situation much more. Um, and it was took a lot of negotiation um, to, to do it, but it just, I didn't understand. I threw this back at them, the curators and the museum. I didn't understand why this wouldn't fit the original theme if it was about contemporary feminism, because the most contemporary feminist thing you could do is allow a working mother, working artist mother, to produce work while still raising her children and her family and having her family present. That work uh, also produced this uh, piece called 16 Minutes, in which um, I worked with the mothers that I interviewed who had babies to reoccupy the museum space with a choreography that involved their children. It's something that we learned last minute. It was a really simple movement of um, carrying their babies by different means, by holding them, by putting it in a baby carrier on their stomachs and by pushing with the stroller. And at the very end, they left their babies. And this act, I think, was one of the most powerful moments because so many of the babies cried and each mother had to, in their own way, tenderly leave their, ba their babies. And you, as the audience, witnessed that heartbreak of having to leave the baby as they are crying. One child is pounding their forehead on to the floor. That's why you see that little white handkerchief by him, because another um, child puts something there to help the baby as the baby is knocking his head against the hardwood floors. Um, and the title 16 minutes refers to the average amount of time Japanese men, Japanese father spend on average with their children per day because most of them are the breadwinners and the main providers of their family. That is how much time they work um, in these um, settings. Um, other pieces like push where the body is an important um, piece shows a kind of response to uh, misogyny. This one in Burma is a direct response where um, I am using my body uh, underneath the traditional clothing here. I taped raw eggs to my body and I made only the men circle up around me and I asked them to push me down as hard as they could. And obviously when they push, they are breaking the eggs on my body, but I never fall down uh, in this. And that's because I did have some self-defense lessons and I learned pretty early on as a teenager how to stand so that you can stay on your feet if there's an attacker that comes at you. And this piece was reproduced for my, um, at Trinity College where I was the visiting assistant professor in international studies as my final performance lecture, um, where even the president of the university, this was an academic highlight, pushed me. I thought that was really profound to get a lot of administrators, perhaps like the dean here, to uh, push me uh, as hard as they could. And then at the very end for this version, I left 99 raw eggs for students, faculty, and staff to uh, beat me throw me, use the eggs to pound me because I became a sacrificial lamb at the altar because it, the whole piece was performed inside a church. And this was during the time in 2015 as uh, Trump was trying to put his campaign in. So there was a lot of hate language 
being circulated and then also um, in the college campuses in America, at least a lot of campuses erupted into protests and riots as a result of um, atrocities that black people were were experiencing due to heavy policing and uh, murderous acts by police officers. Um, and so the performance doesn't end until all 99 eggs are fully utilized. Um, and this is an instance where I'm using my body as um, a vehicle for other people to then enact their pent up anger, their frustration to take it out on me because I believe that I can handle it. And that is part of that body as sacrifice. Um, I'd like to move through and, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna have eggs. Is that the uh, Nasi Lamak? <laughs> um, I, I don't know how to get this faster. So let me just get to, I'm gonna flash through some of this work because uh, there's not enough time to talk about it, but I wanted to talk about really the diasporic dilemma and this idea that, that I am constantly fluctuating between an insider outsider uh, wherever I go. And I think that is a result of the complexities of my identity politically and culturally and religiously. And that is constant. I never feel like I'm quite at home uh, in America, in Cambodia, wherever it is. Even uh, I think that the most home I feel is actually when I'm engaging as an artist. So I feel like every time I perform, that to me is like a sacred space, that I'm ritualistically creating a space that I feel so comfortable that I can expose myself or my ideas around uh, the themes that I'm working with to the public and or through other visual means. And so this is one of the early pieces in So I really went into creating a composition performatively with just the idea of knowing that if I set the red against a rice field with a color theory, that it would make something quite beautiful. And so this is what, uh, what you're seeing here. Um, and then I tried the black and white dress. This is called the vertigo dress. This is a very, very large dress uh, that is huge, uh, circular. And it was the idea that I was experimenting with these black lines in my studio. Uh, and then what would these rigid black lines look like if I put it on my body and then took it outside of the studio? Again, you're seeing these themes of taking things outside of the studio and experimenting with it. And so here you, you see the creation of a beautiful photo, but what you don't know, and I love to tell this story because performance artists like Ms. Intan here will know is you all might see these incredible images and think, wow, whoa. But what you don't know is I am being bitten by large ants and all sorts of creatures in the middle of this rice field. So our idea of these beautiful rice fields is just that. It lives as an idea. But the actual labor and the work and all the creatures you deal with in these um, rural rustic settings is a whole nother thing. Um, and I think it's part of the performance story with, with all performance artists um, who deal with this. Just like this. This is uh, the sarong roots. These were batik sarongs I had collected. Uh, 
between all my travels because I realized that the Batik Sarung was the one thing that connected my ancestral lineage between Cambodia, Thailand, and Malaysia. So I started to collect these from 2003 until uh, 2008. And I made the dress in 2008 and then it um, had it until 2015 because it was lost in a gallery fire. So this dress doesn't exist anymore, but this is the last image that uh, I took of the dress. And again, what you're not seeing is it's a beautiful dress. It's a very typical uh, yellow colonial building in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, but the smell of this particular location is stinky. There's, I'm sure, questionable material, maybe bodily material that have been extracted and placed on the stairwell. I'm not sure, but here's that moment as a performance artist. You see stink and disgustingness, but I see a beautiful cascading opportunity for a dress to take shape. Um, then you have this opportunity to return. And I think that I've been very fortunate to have an opportunity to come back to Cambodia as an adult in 2011. And this is the returning diaspora. All these years, for 30 years, I have lived outside of Cambodia and grown up as an adult. And it isn't until 2011 that I get to come back and maybe have the opportunity to live there longer. And I come upon um, as part of my research and interest in bringing people together and acknowledging people who are on the outside of the world. What you're looking at is one of the final images um, my partner and I took um, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia with a group of deported Cambodian Americans. These are young people my age who made a mistake when they were a teenager in America. And then as a result of that mistake, they were imprisoned. Some of them because of violence, because of gang violence, because of um, selling drugs, because of having a DUI. Not all of their crimes were violent crimes, but because they didn't have their US citizenship, they were targeted even more. And so after many of them served their time in the U.S. system, some serving seven years, 13 years, 15 years, so maybe even 20 years, growing up in the prison system of America, because they didn't have their citizenship, they were then kicked out of the country. They were exiled as part of the law um, that a lot of people are working to reform because it is an injustice. How do you serve your time? Because that's what you're supposed to do in society. You pay your debt to society by serving your time. But why are you being punished even more now, returning to a country that you have no idea what it's about? And so this is the complexity that's in my Cambodian American community in America. But I was blessed enough to go back to Cambodia and make a lot of films as part of Studio Revolt to share their narratives and to share their stories. Because when you come upon these folks in the deported community, everything about them says they're American, except that they don't have the citizenship and that they made that awful mistake when they were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years, years old. Um, now that brings us to some of the most ambitious work with the Buddhist bug and that series and that tackling of that insider outsider complexity that I shared with you. Um, and, and this is where I really learned to hone the idea of the in-between as a powerful place for creation. And really a lot of the Buddhist bug project um, is the result of my collaboration with my partner, Masihiro Sugano, and it is the creation of this creature, this mythical, fantastic creature that um, expands to about 100 meters long um, and is a direct result of 
following the Muslim hijab rules of modesty. And I call it the chador. You can call it a scarf. You can call it a headscarf. You can call it a dubatta. You can call it a, um, uh, um, uh, what do we call it in, in Malay? The, the turkung, turkung. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is also a combination of when I first went to uh, Cambodia, I was obs I did not realize how much of a minority my Muslim family was until I saw the the sea of orange and the amount of Buddhism that is physically present um, and also spiritually and philosophically present in Cambodia. It is now a country of 98% Buddhism, but I noticed that the monks were everywhere and I started to obsessively secretly take pictures of monks. And so I would watch them and then I would pull out my camera and I would take these pictures of monks on a boat, monks walking on a beach, monks on a motorcycle, monks washing themselves in a waterfall. Um, and so this obsession led to then thinking through the diasporic dilemma and my need to create something that would be a creature. I knew it had to be a creature. I knew it had to be orange to acknowledge the overwhelming Buddhism that I experienced, but I also knew it had to be Muslim in some capacity. Um, so I modeled the front of it like the chador and um, if you are a very observant Muslim, you know that you show only your face and your hands and your feet. Uh, and so that is really what took shape in the Buddhist bug. Um, and I started to write these haikus. Um, I started to write these haikus um, that you can see up here and then um, created all these images to show that really from daylight to nightfall and inside classrooms and outside amusement parks and along stairwells and street corners that the Buddhist bug really, the Buddhist bug um, appears present and visible and well aware of um, of, of their presence um, in these spaces. And here uh, you see that the Buddhist bug in this moment has a moment with another Muslim woman where they're, they are almost reflections of one another in this moment, perhaps seeing each other for the first time. Um, the Buddhist bug travels sort of constantly, uh, but you don't know where the bug is trying to get to. You only know that they are constantly on a journey. Um, and one of the things that's, of course, very compelling about this work is its length. And that length is as a result of my idea of trying to connect two disparate points. Whether that two-ness is the diasporic dilemma or the cultural, the bicultural experience, experience of being American and Asian, Cambodian and a Chicagoan, or being here and there. I wanted something that um, in an abstract way was trying to connect two points that would be connected through some kind of um, material. And it just happens to take the shape of this tunnel that is also a bridge. Again, it's the idea that I want to be a connector, a connector. And um, the idea for this came as a result of a play tunnel that I was gifted after my, my first daughter's uh, birth. She was playing with this collapsible tunnel. I think some of you who have kids or nieces and nephews know what I'm talking about, this object that kind of you can put it out and it springs out and like kids love going through it. And when I looked at it, I, I knew that that was gonna be 
my inspiration for for this form. Um, and then last, this this piece, the Buddhist bug, by putting Buddhism and Islam together in one body, it is for me trying to rectify the spiritual turmoil that I feel. It is a religious and a spiritual turmoil. I'm not a super orthodox Muslim woman, even though I grew up with a religion and I know all these Quranic surahs, things we had to memorize, all the du'as, but there are some parts of the religion that I do have a problem with, particularly the patriarchy uh, and some of the homophobic um, ideas um, that are perpetuated. Um, so with this, you see that the Buddhist bug takes uh, a chance in many settings in Cambodia from rural to urban. And then every time I put the suit, the garment as an installation, to me that makes no sense without the body. The body must activate that installation. And that is why uh, in every piece, when you see the suit up, there would have been a performance, a live performance inside the gallery or outside the gallery. Um, and I think that a lot of these images show that idea that I like to take the work outside of the studio, that it's more um, activated when you go outside into the people and when you give people an opportunity to experience the performance, even if they don't quite understand it. I am okay with that. I am more interested in them seeing, experiencing, and feeling something odd and asking the questions, why? Why is she doing this? What am I looking at? Who am I looking at? And how is this possible? Why do I feel odd about it? What is this? And they can keep asking that over and over. And I think it's okay that the answers don't aren't quite clear. I think that's the power of art is that we don't need to give all the answers. We need to keep asking the questions and we need to keep our audience asking the questions. Um, I think when the answers are too clear and too didactic and too obvious, uh, it becomes something else and it limits the opportunities for imagination um, to grow. Um, so many of these images uh, were created over 10 years, some in my birth village. So for example, this image here is in a, a land that is my grandmother's land that is now occupied by someone else. But everybody in that region, in that village knows that it is my grandmother's former land that Obviously, she has no rights to it now that uh, my family left Cambodia. Then you have an image like this where it's a classroom of Muslim and Khmer Buddhist children in the Muslim part of the village where I grew up, uh, not where I grew up, where I was born, where my parents grew up. Um, and then stills like this from a video version of this, I think are really interesting moments to see everyday activities. Like the, a lot of this town is known for making this specific kind of fish, a dried fish. And like just seeing the juxtaposition of this bright orange creature who is also observing the hijab with another Muslim person, a Muslim girl, uh, doing her everyday activities, I think, again, is an interesting moment. And I always ask, you know, the question in a lot of my work, especially when dealing with Islam, is why do we have to wear black? Like, who said? I would like to know who set out the idea that Muslim women in their hijab and in their modest dressing have to wear black? And I just want us to think about that, because if we think about the Arabization of Islam beginning in the Arab Peninsula, uh, it's hot. Why would you wear black to absorb the sun? I mean, it's very, you know, you would want to wear white or light colors, something that reflects and doesn't absorb. So it's just something to think about, like the question of why, why, why are we 
why are we uh, constantly kind of sticking to these ideas? And is it okay to, um, to move away from that color and still practice um, a modesty in how we present our bodies as women, as Muslim women um, all over the world? Kids have an amazing time with this work when it's performed live. I think that kids activate my work in a way that is unfiltered and that is uh, that shows a joy and a friendliness that I think adults don't seem to have. Adults have a lot more fear uh, when they come upon my work. Um, the final piece uh, that I would like uh, to share. Oh, and by the way, with the Buddhist bug, I feel to this day that the Malaysian audience has been the best. The best moments of my performances have come from the Malay audience at Wailing Gallery and the uh, the kind of people that have engaged, um, that have been uh, very friendly to the bug and open, um, knowing its implications, right? And let's be clear, this is, this could be a very difficult piece uh, for many people to accept, right? The hybridity of something that could be both Buddhist and Islam in one body. Um, and by, I, I'm gonna just move because this is kind of a bigger lecture, but you can kind of see that the final work that is an ongoing work is the Red Chador series. This is another work that uses religious aesthetics and textiles to kind of present a hybrid body. In this case, she is both modeled after the Muslim garment, but also Catholicism, Catholics. Catholics have a pageantry in their presentation uh, of a lot of their outfits around their religiousness. And so this is um, modeling after that. But when I first created this in 2015, it was a response to these horrific global headlines that were seeing Muslims as barbaric, as terrorists, as people who killed, who did a lot of beheadings. And um, there was a lot of Islamophobia, right, down to the ban of the burkini and even the ban of the burqa in France. And France has colonized so much of the world, including Muslim majority countries. Um, and yet we were seeing this, uh, these kinds of headlines. And so uh, we know that, you know, it's a challenge to of course question the media. And so when I was thinking about the work, I was thinking about the way that I grew up with the religion, oftentimes with this kind of outfit, this is, I'm sure very, familiar to Malays because this is what my family wears. This is what I wear for Eid prayers. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, um, the inspiration from Catholic uh, cardinals and then Star Wars. And the uh, my kind of love of science fiction and of a sense of humor. And so that's how you get the Red Chador as a persona, someone that is larger than life. And so in 2015, she was an executioner of French baguettes in the Palais de Tokyo for 12 hours. She had 99 baguettes. Baguettes are a French national sim symbol. In fact, the baguette is now a UNESCO intangible world heritage. Um, so this was a very controversial piece because what I did was I selected a baguette every hour and I made a demand to the people because I was an executioner. I said, um, I am holding this baguette hostage and it's going to uh, be executed if you don't meet my demands. And I made many different demands and I put a kitchen timer and they had one hour to complete the demands. And if they didn't, then um, I would take a big butcher knife and behead the baguette, and then the part that is beheaded would fall into that basket that you see there every hour. And um, I'm gonna see if I can find the. So some some of the 
Some of the demands were bring me Mona Lisa's smile. Um, give me a bottle of air from Cambodia. Bring 99 Muslims into the museum. Bring me a strand of hair from Marie Antoinette's wig. Bring me a flag from every former French colony. Bring me a truckload of your best cheese. I want a private meeting with Inspector Clouseau and bring me the Pink Panther. Uh, I, I demand that all meals in the French schools are halal. So you could see it's kind of ridiculous and absurd and it's playing with French ideology and French mannerisms and expectations. And that's the whole point of it. Uh, there are many stories around this piece. Uh, but my work doesn't just exist in the museums. There's always a moment when the Red Chador goes out into the public and tries to kind of infiltrate, right, and, and be with people and go into the red light district, go into the subway, kind of really occupy spaces and make herself seen and visible. And she's performed this all over the world, um, including at different college campuses, uh, like the one that I was a visiting assistant professor at. Uh, I love this photo where she's relaxing under the watchful eye of some past president. Uh, and then really, there have been a lot of really awful remarks uh, that have been made uh, in people's experiences of the Red Chador, especially in the United States of America. Uh, and so I'm just going to put them out here. I don't need to uh, ventriloquize uh, these words. Um, this is my favorite. I'm calling campus security. Um, and yes. Okay. Uh, the clock was because of this young boy in the US that came to a science class making a clock, but the principal thought it was a bomb. This was the year that happened. Um, other reactions, these are pretty typical reactions. And then some of the images here uh, with people's reactions. I'm going to kind of open it up now because I know we're running out of time and uh, this piece. So the kind of problem with a lot of my pieces is a lot of them are really long, like 10 years and they're different iterations. So every city I perform, I always take the context of the city. So here you see Washington, D.C., which is the U.S. state capital. So clearly I will be doing something. I have done something that is around patriotism. Uh, then you'll see in um, uh, Hong Kong, this is San Francisco. This is Hong Kong um, to be aligned with the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement. I allowed people to protest with the Red Chador inside the space of an art fair because there was no other chance for them to do so. And then you have kind of other iterations of the work. Then when Donald Trump became president in 2016, the day after it was announced he was president, Masahiro Sugano and I took the Red Chador out as part of my act of protest. The only way I know how to, um, to kind of push forth what I do is to put my body out there into the public space. So here you see her holding a sign on one side, it says, ban me. On the other side, it says, I am a Muslim. During this durational performance on this one day, many people came up to me and many people whispered. First, they were very polite and they asked to give me a hug. They asked if they could take a selfie. And then so many people whispered, I am so sorry, I stand with you. Because we all at that moment in 2016 knew what was coming, like that he was going to 
um, push forth the Muslim ban and that he had an agenda to really uh, make it miserable for anybody who was not a white man. Uh, and then I had the beautiful opportunity of performing in Kuala Lumpur at the National Gallery. And that was the last time the Red Shador performed because shortly after uh, I traveled from Kuala Lumpur to Ramallah, Palestine, and the Red Shador garment was taken from me in Tel Aviv and was never seen since. Airport? Huh? Airport? At the airport, the bag that had the, I had two bags checked in uh, to come back to the US and the bag that had the red chador was taken while the other bag came back. Um, so I do think it is a political act of uh, enforced disappearance, similar to many other cases of people who, are dis who have disappeared because of their politi political uh, agitation, and I believe that uh, that is what happened with the garment. I have another theory that perhaps there was a queer Israeli officer that just fell in love with the dress and is well. secretly, you know, pretending to be the Red Chador at a drag show or in private spaces. It's not clear. <laughs> um, but it was a really beautiful moment at the very first uh, KL Biennale. I have my friend Intan to thank for that. And I think people in Malaysia, like I said, from the Buddhist bug to the Red Chador have been extremely receptive and open. And it's been really awesome to tell that story globally, to tell people that, you know, I had an amazing reception. Like you think that there's going to be a conservativeness, right? That's maybe what the rest of the world might think of a Muslim majority country. But when I tell the story that no, the best reactions have been here in Kuala Lumpur, maybe it's different in Kotobaru. That is yet to be seen. We are going there next week. So we, we will see. But it has been very amazing uh, to have that reception in Kuala Lumpur. The work, uh, because it went missing, then had a period of mourning and had a period of loss. And so I really enacted different memorials to chronicle the death. So even in loss, I think that you can make work to, to honor the loss, that to put grieving uh, as part of the work itself. And so I made an obituary, I um, hired a journalist to write an actual obituary translated into multiple languages and left as, an, as a newspaper that only celebrated uh, the Red Chador. And then I enacted different rituals, both Buddhist, Muslim, and kind of a combination. Um, and then it wasn't until 2019 that I then rebirthed the project, created a new garment. But this time she is surrounded uh, and she's birthed, again, mythically. For me, it's important to have the elements. So she's birthed out of water and fire. This is a volcano. And um, she is now surrounded by six other chadors. I call them chadoras in different colors, um, different colors. And this is a great image uh, photographed by Masahiro Sugano where you see the combination of uncovered bodies with covered bodies sort of taking over the beach uh, in Honolulu. And then even when we're so colorful and beautiful and to me, very innocent, you still get this moment of high security, on alert, ready to take us down if we did anything. Uh, but to me, it's the new version of the work and she's not alone anymore. Because she died alone, I felt it was very important that she now is surrounded by other chadoras, other bodies, and continues to occupy spaces uh, and create these powerful images where her presence and her body and her visibility uh, is the highlight of, of, the, of the work and of the performance.
So I'm going to end it there so that we can have um, some discussion and Q&A. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anita, for such a rich, rich presentation. I'm going to end the slideshow here so that um, everyone can um, see you clearly on the... For all those who are joining you in mind, hello, uh, welcome. So I'm going to now introduce uh, the uh, second, well, we're going to move on to the second half of our uh, presentation today, which is uh, to have our discussant join in the presentation. Uh, and we thought, uh, who better to have uh, as a discussant than an in-betweener himself, right? Uh, our newly appointed um, uh, Lebanese born, but they not based and recently moved to Malaysia curator, filmmaker, and art critic, uh, Mr. Khaled Ramadan, yeah? uh, who was uh, previously the curator of the Perak Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and also the Maldives Pavilion and the Venice Biennale as well, as well as uh, you've also co-curated the Manifesta, right? If I'm not wrong. So over to you, Mr. Khaled, if you want to take over the seat to have a conversation with um, uh, Anida before we open two questions for the floor. Using technological here. Thank you, Salman. Thank you so much. Um, well, such an impressive presentation, and I indeed identify yeah. myself in it because I witnessed the 1975 civil war in Lebanon yeah. when I was a child. So there is a lot of similarity on personal level, and that's where I want to actually to start. We have seen uh, Anita's public activities. We have seen your um, interventions around in the public uh, spaces. On the personal level, when it comes to the identity, do you have multiple identities on personal level? Where do you, how do you feel today being in such a transitional nomadism? I say. When you what, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by transitional? Do you and think it's subtle. getting better? Uh, do you think it's like getting better, more pluralistic? What do you what do you think? Hard to be in, in this nomad. Uh, and and the, the, the perfect example is what's taking place in, in, in France. Uh, this is a, so it's already a similar things that took place in the U.S. when it was George Floyd. So all this adds up to this multiplicity of identity and complexity. Um, so I'm interested to, uh, I hope that also the uh, audience also share this interest of a uh, uh, question of um, personal identity. What, what do you stand today? How, how do you feel about the world's going through all this on personal level? Yeah, there is a, there's a really great podcast that I did um, as part of the um, Aga Khan podcast that I got to talk about this, this very thing about the changes and whether we're actually going forward or not. Because, you know, when I grew up in America, in the suburbs of Chicago, with the Muslim community that I did, it was so rich. It was, it, I met Pakistanis and Indians, Egyptians, Syrians, Jordanians, and we were a mixed community celebrating. And they had, they had countries that weren't yet devastated the way that it is now. You know what I mean? Pakistan back then in the 90s, uh, in the 80s and the 90s was a different place than it is now. And the same with Syria, right? So I lived through that period of being on the outside of that, but having, for example, my Arabic teacher was a Syrian um, and he was one who taught us, you know, so much of the Quranic Arabic and the stories that came out of it. And so my experience of Muslim people was humanizing. 
deeply, deeply humanizing. And so you can imagine the shock of 9-11 happening when literally in my communities, um, I was hearing stories of aunties and uncles being targeted, being pulled into a van, a secret van, and being taken somewhere and people not knowing where they were. And then the um, heightened amount of hate crimes that was um, happening to Muslim people. And then on top of that now, even if you fast forward to um, COVID-19 and the anti-Asian violence in America, you know, so I think that the thing that that always disturbs my psyche is the hyper-racialization and the violence of America. That that to me is is the complexity that is hard for me to deal with because when I step outside of America, I feel more human. I feel more human, like running into Simon in Sharjah, for example, and seeing the amazing amount of works that tries to challenge the colonialism, to try to decolonize art, decolonize the museums, humanize all these corners of the world from Azerbaijan to Syria to Kurdistan. You do not see that in America. I would argue Europe too. You know, but they take up so much of the media space. They export so much of their ideas and ways of being and doing and academic knowledge and books and uh, culture. That's the problem, is it so permeates the rest of the world's imagination with these countries that actually uh, are very problematic in how they see communities, how they deal with race and gender just as much as when they point the finger at all the other developing countries, right? So that's something I'm trying to rectify. And I say this all the time in the different circles that I'm in, especially within my American circle, is how much I love getting out of the country because it beats you up uh, from the instant that you are in the line to going back, even though I hold a U.S. passport every single time I'm on pins and needles because so often I have to stand in another line because I have the special selection and it's because the algorithm pulls up any Muslim name that comes up and I know for sure my name comes up because it's happened many, many a times. Many, many a times. Second year. Ali. Ali. Yeah, it's another year Ali. And every single time, I mean, this one time I traveled with two American academics, and I was detained in Houston, Texas at the airport, separated from the two of them. I literally was in a detention area because they were looking up and verifying me, even though I had a U.S. passport. Uh, so I also know this because when I was in Lithuania, when I was checking in, they couldn't check me in. They had to call a special number from Lithuania because my name came up. So those are the things like I know for sure that there is a problem with their vigilantism combined with their arrogance, the American arrogance uh, and hypersecurity concerns. Um, and I know this doesn't exactly answer your question, but I think that's why we make art is to try to uh, resolve for ourselves, a way of, of understanding and processing the world as only artists can do in the different mediums that they try. You know, we process it through the art. We may not, it may not be like a direct answer to, to a question we have, but I think we're processing it. You know, there's something about for me, very empowering about taking a specific persona into the public space and not caring what people think, even if it's misread, misinterpreted, not caring at all, but holding on to your humanity in that moment and saying, I feel powerful enough that I am going to take up this bit of space and I am going to go on the subway in this full costume like this or whatever it is. I think that that 
it, those are powerful moments of resistance. I think you picked up my subliminal message when you talk about art in the conjunction to identity. Um, I think that uh, now maybe people would like to ask a question. I'm sure it was such an articulation and impressive. No, okay, we start. Let's talk to the next yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm actually very amazed with all your works and congratulations for your boldness. So as I was looking at all these images, right, of your works, I was just thinking about the body that you put out there you know, how vulnerable the body is, like especially that uh, work where the 99 eggs were thrown at you, like, you know, so being out there, you're not actually submitting, but it's more sometimes subversive because you're making political statements and the body itself is very political out there. So how do you deal with vulnerability being out there uh, because you don't know how people are going to react? Right? Um, that's one. Another one is out of curiosity, that uh, project that you did, Hello, How Are You? Yeah. How did people respond to that? Like, how did the neighborhood, like, you know, removing the fences, for example, did they do that? Or did people really give in to that project, like they didn't want to do something? Or they were against it, against that idea? So I have these two questions for you. Thank yeah. You. I think those are great questions. Let me answer the easier one with uh, hello, how are you? Um, we weren't sure exactly how receptive that was going to be. And the idea there is uh, we know that there's a lot of development in that neighborhood. And we knew that we were being seen as outsiders coming in. And so the only way we could introduce ourselves as a family of artists is to put the artwork out in the public. And when you deal with public art, it's very hard uh, to get the layers of permission. Uh, I think those of you who are working on a large scale might know that. And so it felt very natural for us to say, you know what, we have this yard. Why don't we just do it in our yard? And like, let's put these letters up and let's welcome people. Um, part of the work before the last letters were put in, we had the commute, we had an opening in our front yard, an opening reception, inviting as many neighbors and people in the community to come and help us install the final letters. And it has been amazing to witness that those letters um, take a life of its own. It got a lot of press coverage for what it was doing. And so we witnessed certain times when there's, of course, tons of people taking pictures, but there's also a school. Our children's school is across the street. And so many kids stop and play with the letters and go around the letters and families. And we see smiles on their faces and joyfulness. Certain moments where we, this one time I saw a car pass the letters by a block and then stop and reverse back in the car, stop, come out and take a selfie. Um, and then people left notes uh, in our mailbox, like really like kind of feeling like this was a landmark for the community. Uh, and then COVID-19 happened and simultaneously the letters were made out of wood. And if you know the Seattle Pacific Northwest area, it's a lot of rain. Um, and so the, the rain destroyed the first iteration of the letters. And so we took it down and it was right when COVID happened. So throughout the lockdown and the pandemic, the letters were gone. Now, I always think there are signs and the universe is listening. And so I also, we, my partner and I took that as a sign, like we need the letters to come back now that people are resurfacing. Because, you know, did you notice that when the letters were gone, there was such a sadness, right? And that's the global state of the world, of course, with the pandemic. And so we only recently got funding to put the letters back up with new material that's more of a plastic. Um, and so my husband partner is actually making the letters individually. The original letters were cut with a CNC router. This one, the letters are being made 
very intentionally, meticulously, one by one. And so before we left for this tour, we put up the word hello. And again, people are responding in very positive ways. We would get a thumbs up all the way from across the street or like people stopping to talk to us. And that really is the point of art, is to stop and talk and see each other, right? Um, so that it, it's very exciting. There's definitely an air of excitement for the letters to come back. And we've even gotten requests. Can you do some letters on my yard? It's like, okay, pay for them. <laughs> um, vulnerabilities that I'm glad that you picked up on that because that's a huge part of my practice. Um, I also teach performance and one of the lessons that I teach in my performance studio classes is vulnerability and how to become more vulnerable with one another and okay. how how do I teach it? You'll have to take my class. <laughs> it is a process. I'll tell you that it's a process especially with students coming out of the pandemic who have been masked for so long. So one of the early lessons in the class is eye contact, seeing each other and holding eye contact, right? So from eye contact, we move from there, it's breath, right? The acknowledgement of breath and like how to work breath into it. Um, and so all of this has been, of course, years and years of me taking workshops and working through these for myself. And I always tell the story of when I was younger, as a middle school a student all the way through high school, I was very shy and super nervous with making any kind of speeches, let alone asking a question in class. I was terrified. It took a long time for me to kind of come into my own confidence and the resolve that no one else is going to be able to tell my story or my family's story or think in the way that I think with the complexities and with the layers of identities, along with the politicization that I have, and that it really is up to me to do this work. Like no one's going to make space for it. No one else is going to do it. No one has ever done it. And so it really was that moment uh, of, of realizing like, this is my only option. Now I've been through many different mediums, different forms to figure out this performance installation form, uh, but it, it, it's, it's been, you know, 30 years of work. And when you are, I do believe that when you're vulnerable, it doesn't mean you're weak. I think there's a difference in the way that men and women are socialized, because I think that, uh, men tend to think that vulnerability is uh, is a is a form of of weakness. Sometimes there maybe the way that society has conditioned men to think that they're not uh, supposed to be these more vulnerable figures. Um, but for me, I actually think that uh, being vulnerable opens up much more powerful places for engagement and experiences. It's also, it's a very heavy, it can be very heavy, like heavy lifting in those moments because when you're that vulnerable, you're also receiving everybody else's energy. So not just the aggressive one, but the ones with really deep pain and trauma that's releasing it to you. And so you, need to be able to pull yourself out of that mode because that is a, a heavy lift at times. Very well put, sir. I think that's uh, when it comes to performance arts, it's actually one of the most criticized art form, you know, and most difficult ones in the individual art context. Um, is there any other Questions here or even online? Dan, you don't have anything? Thank you so much for the talk. And my question uh, very fascinated. Uh, and I think you'll be this uh, become aware that the performance aspect is central. 
こにそのタイプのポーズをもらって、ジョーナルとかを見て、of you in the performance mode。So, given that there's a very strong performance component to photographs in the show n e r I guess what I'm curious about is just、uh, whether what type of personalities do those personas that you perform actually have in terms of how they interact with the audiences, whether the Buddhista and the great shadow, do they have very different personalities? Do they have、uh, what is the mode in which the action takes place? Thank you. Uh, maybe that can help us to understand all the people's charge of performance. Yeah, so, <clears throat> no, they do not speak.、Uh, although the Rentador, the very first iteration with the demands, with the 99 baguettes, she spoke as an executioner、uh, to, in order to make her demands in French and English、uh, heard. So that was the one exception. But many of those personas from the white mother, red c h a d o r the red naga dress, the vertigo dress to、uh, the Buddhist bug do not speak. And that's intentional because when I started to travel in 2003 for my art form, at the time my art form was performance poetry done in my English, my very American English,、um, in a very poetic way. That was unapologetic. But every single time I would perform the poetry, because you o k n when w you go as an artist, you're asked to kind of show your work. And so, as a performance artist, everybody was asked to share their work. And so, for me, it was my poetry. And I would get up there with my memorized poems and like give it, you know, the very powerful arms are like going every. It happened in. And、um, Cambodia and Phnom Penh、uh, and, and Ho Chi Minh City. But each time the audience failed to understand the nuance of my English poetry. The thing that I had worked so hard to perfect, right, to、um, at least in America, had lost. Itself in the translation, in its effect. People could see and experience some kind of passion. They knew that I was angry, I was very passionate, and I got a lot of feedback about, oh my God, that, that was really great. But what were you saying? What, what exactly were you saying? You know, so there was a failure in that art form to transcend in a way that. Others could come into the work. So, in that moment, was when I also, it was a big change in the direction of my work. The dancers who I shared space with and the musicians did not have that challenge. And I saw that. And the visual artists, too, did not have that challenge of their work failing to be understood with a clarity. Right. So that's when I decided that I was more interested in figuring out an art form, especially if I was to bring the work more internationally and work within these contexts that I think is where my work thrives currently. That I was going to try to do work without speaking a word. That how does the body. And the things that you would create around the body help to create an image for people and a space for them to enter into very difficult conversations. So, in many ways, a lot of my work tricks people into this conversation. For them, they may not think this is about religious tolerance or politicization of hybrid religiosity. But I am bringing them into this moment that is a. They just don't think that because they're having a lot of fun with it, or they're so perplexed that, you know, because I've gotten the angry remarks too, that it's really the performances are a reflection of what they think they are seeing. 
not exactly what I want them to see. So all of them come with an interpretation based on everything they carry into that moment. That's exactly uh, how it is often, you know, uh, when it comes to the interpretation of an artwork, whether it's a public space or in a private space, it's always that uh, the audience, what's really in them, uh, what has been, uh, their identity has been constructed and they reflect on, on the artwork based on that. So um, do we have any other questions? I'll repeat again, see if anyone online would like to ask questions. We're also taking from online questions. Go ahead, huh? Let us know. Yes, right. I'll oh, have to check. Okay, set. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Coming to the auditorium then. Um, um, I also do have to say that that's one of the things I think that is also the hardest for performance artists is. Um, how do we tell the stories that come from the experiences? Because the photos and the videos only set up the stage for it, but the art happens in between what the audience is experiencing and what they are witnessing. So that space is never sort of documented or presented in any of our works, right? Because that is where the art is. But it's very hard as a performance artist to map it out without it being didactic as an exhibition. You were you're working with being self, the subject and the object. One can say that. Um, but how's how's the? I, I was wondering how is especially in the U.S. How's the the? I would say the um, immigrant my. Uh, constituency, how, how do they take their work, your work? Because um, is there any particular groups of audience that understand better than others when you, you work in the public space? Okay, any other specific groups of people that would understand the work best? They know, I think that everybody who's a little bit of something brings in like a different experience or read. I think obviously the most open, no, I would argue that whether you're the most open or the most closed, I've had the experience where really closed up people have had profound experiences with the work. So one example is in Washington, D.C., when I was the Red to Door, surrounded by 99 U.S. flags, there was a mother-daughter pair, and the mother was an older woman who was very hesitant to, because what the Red to Door in the Washington, D.C. space did was she beckoned people to come forth, and they would come through, and then they would just to have a moment, a silent moment with her. She does like these different gestures or she'll hold their hand and bring it to her heart or she'll just hold their hand there. And um, the daughter clearly was interested in coming and she said to her mom, come on, mom, she's calling us, we should do this. And the mom was like, I don't do these things. I don't want any part of this. You know, and the daughter kept saying, come on, let's just give it a try. And the mom was very hesitant finally came the both of them and I could feel this energy right like this woman is like not interested and so I took her the mom's hand and I pulled it in and I had a moment just holding her hand then I took her hand and I had her touch me touch my face under my veil and then I had her remove my veil smiled at her and she totally softened and you could see her whole body soften and she smiled back and she said, and she said, that. and it was just this moment, you know, of just her relaxing into it. And so that happened. And there were so many of those moments, especially in Washington, D.C., because so much of that audience, that particular space gets thousands of people random. They are not 
my audience, right? They are as random as you can get from a, you know, there was a Marine in uh, plain clothes that was watching the whole thing. And you could tell he was very muscular and built. And he went to the director of the program and said some things. And then that director told me later that he said that this performance and installation was really a proud moment for him because this is why he you know, fought for the U.S. This is why he did his tours in Afghanistan, is for this reason. I mean, it's a very patriotic answer, but, you know, for him, it was an important, recognizable moment that what he did as a soldier was to stand up for people's rights and to have this moment where a Muslim woman can be surrounded by a jungle of American flags and exercise this seemingly contradictory image. Wow, that's a that's a amazing moment. It must have been really to be there. Um, any other questions, Simon? You have questions? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Maybe I'm more oriental, this sort of thing, then, the threats of when you get the things that are going on in the US. Uh, and America estimated by, you know, the discord around what Americans like to call POC. POC, yeah. Yeah, people have a. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the experience. I, I guess the POC sort of like discord line and the politics and the on the much more. It's a solidarity, solidarity building sort of like movement, right? Um, you know, it cuts across race, gender, religion, culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But where does Islam or say a Muslim artist, Muslim identifying artist like yourself, sit within this? Yeah, that's a really great question, and that'll be very hard to unpack. And so, even the word POC is outdated. They now go by BIPOC. And this is, you know, BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, so that it's more inclusive. And this is a particular thing with American and the semantics because of the history of the way that oppression has worked um, against people who are non-white in America. They, they, there are all these communities that have come into trying to have their voices heard through political power and or through cultural institutions, that they've had to come up with these words to, to, to make them like more human. And so we're at a stage where we're going through that linguistically. Um, but it's, it doesn't translate. You know, this is the problem with um, American ideology is it's so insul insular and specific to America that they cannot see the sort of when you step out of America, all of those words kind of fall apart because they're so specific um, to the context of America. So it's complicated in that. And I think. Um, yeah. I think that there, even within like Muslim communities, there are factions within that. There are more progressive Muslims, and then you have much more the majority of conservative Muslims. So it's hard. It depends on the region of the U.S. and the work of these um, these community solidarity efforts. So I'm in a part of the country that's a lot more progressive. So you will have 
some Muslims uh, who, who have that openness and we have even a Muslim queer group. You know, this is not indicative of other Muslim communities in America, especially more of the mainstream Muslims. So you still have that. So I feel like you can't really make those intersections because now you have to look at specific to that community. So you kind of have to go in very specific and say like, okay, Chicago, city of Chicago, Muslim community on the South side is very different than Chicago suburb, you know, in a wealthy part of the country. So that's that's what I mean by all of this kind of falls apart as people are struggling to, of course, assert their religious identity while, you know, being in this big um, fusion pot of holding on to their cultural heritage, their religious heritage, their political, you know, inclinations. So I'm not sure. I know that I just throw it all out there and see what sticks. That's kind of how I operate. Whoever comes are the people who then I feel uh, need to experience the work. Any additional questions from the in the okay, I have I have two questions actually. One of them is that the acceptance of your work in the mainstream institutions in the US specifically, and the second one is what's going on with the gender ideology today? How how do you feel with this debate? It's very hot for the moment in the US. So which the debate? Gender the gender ideology mm. no, it's a question of it's particular film that was produced by uh, Matt Walsh, the, what is a woman that have impacted so many things regard also oh, when I it comes that. to, you didn't see it, okay, it's also when it comes to friends um, uh, participating in, in women's sport and so on, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that debate, but the mainstream institution, um, recipients of your work, how, how do you, how do you evaluate that so far in the U.S.? Oh, that's a, uh... That's another hard one to unpack. I think that um, especially with the the issues of trans transgendered peoples, that's kind of the rights of transgendered bodies that are under attack um, currently, like politically, legislatively, you know, culturally. Um, I think that's why my a lot of my personas are a kind of gender queer and gender fluid. I mean, there is nothing that sort of identifies them as specifically like cisgendered women. You know, um, I self-identify as a feminist, but that doesn't mean it's like woman as you traditionally see it. Um, so I think that that's interesting. And even with the seven chadors, some of those are the people underneath are not all what you would traditionally call a woman or a cisgendered woman. There are trans folks and there are men that are in those chadors as well. And I'm open to all of that because what the public doesn't see is that in the creation of the seven chadoras, there is a workshopping aspect. Those seven people that are coming together, the six with me, are workshopping through why are we doing this? What has brought us to this moment? And do you align with the ideas that are being read across the themes of this work and talking about homophobia and Islamophobia? I think that at least in America, if we're to fight for Muslim rights, we need to also stand with other rights that are under attack. And that's why the work of the Red Shadow was reinvented to be on such an epic scale. I'm currently working on that uh, iteration of 99 of them. So I'm expanding that uh, to really put out the full visibility of these, uh, these um, chadoras who I think it's interesting to play with, with gender and culture through the garments, you know, through the concealment 
of the actual bodies that are underneath that. But the second part is, uh, do you see any resistance uh, on this kind of oh, yeah. in the mainstream and the institutions? I mean, art institutions. I do. I see a lot of resistance. Um, and I would say that the resistance is not necessarily to the theme in terms of cultural institutions. Their resistance, at least in America, I think is to performance. Is is because American institutions uh, are so big on legal issues and liability and the legality of what you're doing, why you're doing, how the public intersects with that and whose fault, whose fault it might be if something happens. That is a really big part of those institutions. And that's what I'm currently um, kind of in it with the negotiation of, uh, I have a major solo exhibition at the Seattle Asian Art Museum coming up from January all the way till July of 2024 and the negotiations for that. And I've negotiated with a lot of big museums, but the American one is me, to me like really restrictive, very restrictive in the way. So it's very hard to push a risk taking. The rest of the world I feel is, has already embraced performance art and given us like a platform to do it and isn't as uh, restrictive, but the American institutions I find to be extremely conservative in their approach to performance artists. That's, that's nice to know. It is. It's, it's, yeah, very also uh, odd to know. Yeah, um, I think if we don't have any other questions, we will wrap it up now and give you the last word to say goodbye also to the audience and uh, put the finale to this discussion. Amazing discussion, I should say. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no, I just want to thank everyone for, of course, enduring all of the heavy English. And uh, uh, if you miss this, uh, there's a lot more like videos that I, I obviously can't show, but I will be doing a, a more collaborative uh, talk on Saturday, July 8th at Wailing Gallery that we will show films that have never been seen before with my partner Masahiro Sugano um, and talking more about the cinematic works um, in that talk, um, that's 11 o'clock. And I think they have very limited seating. So if you go to Wailing's uh, Instagram or my Instagram, you can sign up for that. And that will be a really good one just to see the, the motion imagery. When was that, the date? Uh, Saturday, July 8th at 11 a.m. Yeah, that would be great. But thank you, Simon, and thank you, uh, everybody here. And um, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be back.